Hi folks, this is Jay. Hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. Um, we're just looking at um, the question about slavery in the Bible. The information um, that I'm getting from the material, and it's called uh, ChristianThinkTank.com. ChristianThinkTank.com, and it's on slavery. So if you type in christianthinktank.com uh, slavery, um, you'll be able to access this information. And I'm just going to read a little bit about the writer, what he says. He says, the specific case of slavery is more complex than first appears. There is no monolithic institution of slavery in the Bible. E.g. the whole testament has several models of what might be called slavery and much of what, what is past as slavery in the a &E, ancient Near East, is no longer considered such in socio-economic understandings of the period and area. In the New Testament case, the problem is usually complicated by the seeming position that all socio-economic that can be either used wonderfully or abused woefully, for example. I am called to be a slave of Christ and to obey within the conscience and stewardship the demands of oppressive governments. This area of cultural forms is notoriously difficult in my opinion, so the Philemon situation is not at all decisive or instructive for me. I am familiar, however, with those civil war debates, but consider much of that simply bad theological method. Simply put, I think the problem is more complex than a simple poll hedged here. I am still thinking through this, so don't take my comments as finished goods. And hence, I want to come back to the issue in this series. So he goes into um, an in-depth analysis of the of this topic, and he's a very good writer, and uh, very very well researched. I am a child of record self. The word slavery is such a powerful vortex of images, meanings, cries, and grief to me. Any technical discussion of any type of forced labor or corvey becomes immediately inflamed with the word slavery is attached to it and I suspect that many others share this association that's why I think the atheist use the word a lot against the Bible it's a very powerful emotive word and they think they can win an argument by just using it just an aside those atheists who use the word slavery against the Bible how do you get out of the naturalist fallacy how do you get out of the is or distinction? Just on the issue of morality, just a little thing there. But anyhow, he writes, the scholars in the a &E have often abandoned the use of the general term slavery in descriptions of the many diverse forms of master-servant that are manifest in the ancient world. There are very few true slave societies in the world, with wrong Greek being two of the major ones. And ancient Israel will be seen to be outside this classification as well, in legislation, not practice. A recent example of this comes from the discussion of the Hittite culture. Um, Gutterbuck quote, he quotes, Butterbuck refers to slaves in the strict sense, apparently referring to chattel slaves such as those of classical antiquity. This characterization may have been valid for house slaves whose masters could treat them as he wished them when they were at fault but it is less suitable when they were capable of owning property and could pay betrothal money or fines. The meaning servant seems more appropriate and perhaps the designation semi-free. It comprises every person who is subject to orders or dependent on another, but nonetheless has certain independence within his own sphere of activity. Scholars in cultural anthropology are sensitive to this as well, writes the Christian Think Tank. Slavery was quite unique historically. Quote, Scholars do not agree on a definition of slavery. The term has been used at various times for a wide range of institutions, including plantation slavery, forced labor, the drudgery of factories, sweet shops, child labor, semi-voluntary prostitution, bride price marriage, child adoption for payment, and paid for surrogate motherhood. Somewhere within this range, the literal meaning of slavery shifts into metaphorical meaning but it is not entirely clear at what point a similar problem arises when we look at other cultures 
The reason is that the term slavery is evocative rather than analytical, calling to mind a loose bundle of diagnosed features. These features are mainly derived from the most recent direct Western experiences within slavery, that of the southern United States, the Caribbean and Latin America. The present Western image hazardly constructed out of the representations of that experience in 19th century abolitionist, abolitionist literature, later novels, textbooks and films from a global cross-cultural and historical perspective. However, New World slavery was a unique conjunction of features. In brief, most varieties of slavery did not exhibit the three elements that were dominant in the New World. Slaves as property and commodities, their use exclusively as a labor and their lack of freedom, end of quote. He says, generally in the A&E, these fuzzy boundaries obtained as well. Slavery is a very relative word in our time period, and we have to be very careful into auto-associating it with more vivid New World examples. For example, in the West, we would never say that the American president's cabinet were his slaves, but this term would have been applied to them in the A&E kingdoms, and as in the A&E, even though children and family could be bought and sold, they were never the property aspect for such transactions did not define explicit notion of slavery. Quote, freedom in the ancient Near East was a relative, not an absolute state, as the ambiguity of the term for slave in all the region's language illustrates. Slave could be used to refer to a subordinate in the social ladder. Thus the subjects of a king were called his slaves, even though they were free citizens. The king himself, if a vassal was the slave of his emperor, Kings, emperors, commoners alike were slaves of the gods, even a social inferior when addressing a social superior referred to himself out of the politeness as your slave. There were moreover a plethora of ser servile conditions that were not regarded as slavery such as son, daughter, wife, serf, human, pledge, etc. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, type in christianthinktank.com slavery. Um, this article was created December 30th, 1999, um, updated on March 18, 2004. It's on Christian Think Tank. The title is Does God Condone Slavery in the Bible? Um, I'm going to discuss what he says in a minute. I've only read a few paragraphs of what he said and the, the scholars that he's quoted. Um, so I'm, going, I'm just going to if you type in Peter Williams, Peter Williams, Dr. Peter Williams, lecture on the Old Testament in YouTube, on YouTube, he, he will give also a good expounding of the word slavery in his lecture on the Old Testament. So type in Dr. Peter Williams on the Old Testament. Uh, he's a scholar who's been resident at Tyndale House uh, and he's done a great lecture on slavery. He's an expert. Um, also, there's a book by Dr. Barnes on slavery. If you go to Google Archive Books and you type in um, slavery by Dr. Barnes, you will find, um, or Albert Barnes, slavery. You'll find about a 300 page book that goes into a massive exposition of what the Bible teaches. So that will really help you if you really want to think about the subject. Have a look at Albert Barnes on slavery, Google Book Ar Archive. You can get the book PDF, read it, it will really help you. Have a look at Dr. Peter Williams' lecture on the Old Testament. He's an authority on this subject and what he says will be a real help to you. Okay. And don't forget to have a look at this very helpful, informative article on ChristianThinkTank.com um, on slavery. Okay. So there's two two points that I want to make here that are very important. When you get these internet atheists saying, "Oh, the Bible teaches slavery," two two points to be made. Number one, their exegesis of the Bible is a joke. They haven't got any real great Bible scholars 
amongst the atheist in the atheist world. I know I've challenged them to debate; they won't debate me. Uh, so, you know, they don't know how to do exegesis. They don't know how to study the Bible. If you study uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament on what slavery is in the Bible, you'll find that there's about six or seven different ideas of it. Um, and you'll find a whole variety of teaching uh, on slavery in the Old Testament, for example. You'll not find one particular model. You'll not find uh, buy a slave, keep him for life, beat him, and that's it. You won't find anything like that. What you'll find is a very complex and a very rich, um, diverse rules and regulations about having what I would call in servants. These people were not slaves as we think they're slaves. These people had rights. If you look at the Old Testament, anybody working for a family for whatever reason had rights. They had the right, for example, to push them unfairly to leave and run away. They had that right. So that that alone, that just that one thought alone, shows you you're not dealing with the same understanding of slavery as say the American Civil War where the slave was bought and beat and whatever. It is a completely different understanding um, in what the Bible's teaching. And the atheists will say, oh no, no, it's slavery, but do your exegesis. Go and get a Bible, go and look at the commentaries, go and study what it what the Old Testament says as a whole, and you'll be quite surprised and amazed. Because the, the people who were taken into families for whatever reason, they had rights. Yeah? Secondly, the way to undermine slavery in the Bible is through the cross, and not politics. In the book of Philemon, Paul says to, uh, to the owner of the slave when he sends him, when, when um, Paul sends him sends it back. It says treat him like you would treat me. So slavery is undermined by Christianity getting to treat the individual as you would be treated. The way Christ dealt with us, he sacrificed himself for us, so whether you're a slave or whether you're a slave owner, you are to sacrifice yourself for the other person, to care for the other person. So Paul undermined slavery in the ancient Roman world by trying to get the slave owner to see the need to love the slave as himself and the slave love the owner as the self and if that's by de facto no slavery so that's how the New Testament undermines slavery not by politics but by the cross yeah so in the Old Testament there's a variety of understandings of what slavery is. It's not the same kind of slavery as we associate it with. That's what the exegesis is, the biblical exegesis. I would encourage you to go and do that. Uh, Albert Barnes on the book, on his book Slavery, will give you an open window in, into how to study the Bible on this. Peter Will Dr. Peter Williams will give you the academic tools to do this. And the Christian think tank will give you the cultural and sociological information to do this. Okay. The second thing we need to think about is the atheists, the skeptics. What I'm surpri what, what surprises me for the, concerning they're not only atrocious in hermeneutics. 99.9% .9 of them have no training in hermeneutics, by the way. None of them have any training. You know, let's get this on the table. Not, no, I've not met any atheist, any skeptic, who's had any training in hermeneutics. That is the science about to understand the Bible. The method of interpreting text, ancient text, for example. 
So I've not met any atheists who have any training whatsoever in the ability to do uh, hermeneutics. Now I would let them off because they're atheists, they're skeptics, and okay, they're not Christians, they're not in, they, they don't know the Bible. So I will, I'll let them off with that. But there's no excuse for not understanding the culture of the time. And this is with the skeptics who claim to be intellectuals, who claim to be smart, yet show an atrocious lack of understanding the scholarship of a particular topic. And in this topic, they don't know the major scholars, the major thinkers in ancient Near Eastern religions, in cultural studies, sociological studies, on these topics. You don't hear them quoting them, you don't hear them talking about them, and like the writer has shown, you, you're in, you're on very dangerous dodgy ground when you start applying our understanding of slavery back into the ancient Near Eastern understanding of slavery. For example, as he picked up on, you know, if you worked for the king, you were seen as a slave. You were free, but you were still seen as a slave. So you've got to understand. You've got to sociological, economic, philosophical, uh, cultural context of the age that you're looking at. And that's what the skeptics never ever do. Even their best scholars, like a Richard Carrion, is atrocious at historical inquiry when it comes to context. Uh, how many times have I caught the guy out quoting text, ancient text, and they're out of context? I can't count how many times I've done it. Uh, Dr. Price, uh, who's an agnostic who the atheists use, how many times have I found and caught this guy out? on his woeful inadequate ability to do exegesis but his stubborn refusal to admit that he's just applying the most backward I could only describe it backward out of date scholarship to his historical inquiry so no honestly Remember to do your exegesis. Remember to study the Bible in its context. Go and get a Bible. Go and get the study tools and go and study slavery as it's taught in the Bible. And you will find, you will be amazed at what you find. It will not be what the atheists are telling you. If you look at the Hebrew, look at the biblical context, etc. The same for the New Testament. Then when you've done that, go and have a read of the experts, the scholars around these topics. And you'll be surprised. And you will see through the nonsense that these atheists and skeptics keep pumping when they attack the Bible. So please mirror this video and may God bless it. And uh, may you be blessed today. God bless. Thank you for listening. So when I hear an atheist say, oh, the slavery in the Bible, I, I, uh, I, I, I just... I, 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 to be honest, I, I hold my hand in despair because they're only doing it for one reason, to score points. They think they're, they're winning an argument. They think that they are beating Christianity, but they're not beating anything. All they're doing is preying on people's ignorance and, and displaying their own ignorance. So thank you for listening. And uh, God bless you and take care. The three sources that I've given you will be an awesome resource for you on this topic. So you need to go away and study. I can't deal with this in a five-minute, ten-minute video. You need to go and study and grapple with it, and you'll be okay. You'll come out the other end, and you'll see that these skeptics are talking from their backside. They don't know what they're talking about. So God bless you, and thank you for listening.